morning, everyone. Welcome to the uh, third talk session of the AGM GCPR 2020. Um, in this session, we are going to have five talks. Two of them are long orals and three of them are short orals. After each talk, we are going to have time for uh, questions. So please, for the audience, ask your questions from the Discord channel. You can find the uh, link to the Discord from the main web page where the program is shown. Um, so we are going to start with the talk of Olga Zatar Zatsarina. Um, and she is going to talk about discovering latent classes for semi-supervised semantic segmentation. Olga, you can start. Hello, everyone. Thank you. Let me just share my screen. Uh, is it on? Yes, you can go ahead. Uh, so yes, my name is Olga, and I guess there was already introduction, so I start right with the presentation. Existing semi-supervised approaches incorporate unlabeled images into training by using the reaches that are easy to segment, or in other words, which have high predicted confidence scores. But there are many regions which are harder to segment, and thus large parts of images get discarded during training. In our approach, we propose in our work, we propose an approach that doesn't discard any information. And uh, the key observation behind our method is that the difficulty of the semantic segmentation task depends on the definition of the semantic classes. We have noticed that networks that are trained with little labeled data often have difficult time distinguishing between classes that are semantically related, such as cat and dog, for example. So if some of these classes can be grouped together, the task can be simplified. Therefore, we do not focus on regions that can be segmented with high confidence, and instead we propose to learn a task that can be reliably inferred for the entire unlabeled image, and then further use to uh, get the additional guidance to solve the initial task. To this end, we introduce a two-branch segmentation network that is trained on labeled and unlabeled images jointly in the end-to-end -end fashion. And now we'll discuss individual parts of our network. While semantic branch learns the original semantic segmentation task, the purpose of the Latin branch is to infer such Latin classes which can be learned uh, reliably using only a small set of labeled data. In contrast to the semantic branch, the Latin branch is trained on labeled data only, and on unlabeled images it is used to get additional supervision signal to train the semantic branch. We also incorporate the discriminator network into our model. It is used to encourage the semantic branch to produce more grantress-like predictions. Next, I'll discuss the details that we, uh, of the training of our model. Starting with the Latin branch, as mentioned previously, it is trained using only labeled data. The goal of the Latin branch is to group the semantic classes into Latin classes in the data viewing way so that the available small fraction of annotated images is um, enough to solve the resulting simpler task uh, accurately. Without any constraints, this would result in a single Latin class and the Latin branch would be able to solve the task with 100% accuracy. To avoid this kind of a trivial solution, we propose to optimize the conditional entropy loss, which ensures that the Latin classes contain as much information as possible about the semantic classes. To be able to compute this kind of a loss term, we need to, uh, to estimate the joint probability distribution and the conditional probability distribution of semantic and Latin classes. We estimate the joint probability distribution component-wise for each possible pair of semantic and Latin classes. Uh, uh, for a particular pair, it's estimated as the normalized sum of the probabilities for else Latin variable to be activated for ground truth uh, for pixels which have the ground truth value C. Having estimated the joint probability distribution, we can estimate the conditional probability distribution by definition, where we get the marginal probability distribution for the Latin classes. Uh, by marginalizing the previously estimated joint probability distribution. Going over to the semantic branch, on the label data, the loss function for the semantic branch contains two terms. The first term is the standard cross entropy loss, and it uh, makes sure that the predictions of the semantic branch are as close as ground truth as possible. And the second loss term is the adversarial loss, and it encourages the semantic branch to predict to make predictions that will be uh, this they will be thought. But the disconnect will recognize this coming from the ground truth. 
and thus uh, they will become more realistic. On unlabeled data, the loss term contains also uh, two terms. The first term is the consistency loss. Given the fact that the Latin branch learns to solve a simpler task than the semantic branch, we can expect that the uh, accuracy of the Latin predictions is going to be higher than the semantic predictions. Therefore, we propose to optimize the semantic branch with respect to the loss that's going to measure consistency between semantic predictions and Latin predictions. The key idea behind the computing this kind of a loss is illustrated in the figure here. To be able to leverage Latin predictions, we had first map the semantic predictions into the Latin probability space. And it is done by marginalizing the joint probability distribution of uh, semantic and Latin classes, which in turn can be written as the product of conditional probability distribution and the marginal probability distribution of the semantic classes. Since we want to map the semantic predictions, we uh, take the semantic predictions of the semantic branch as the marginal probability distribution. To estimate the conditional probability distribution, we keep track of uh, co-occurrence of Latin and semantic classes on the label data with help of the exponential moving average. And then the conditional probability is estimated as the fraction of times where particular semantic and Latin classes uh, occurred together. Having mapped the semantic probability distribution uh, to the Latin probability distribution, the consistency loss is computed as a cross entropy loss between the predictions of the Latin branch and the maps that were constructed from the semantic branch using the previously described procedure. By optimizing this kind of a loss, the semantic branch is encouraged to produce such semantic classes which would be mapped to highly probable Latin classes. The second loss term is uh, the adversarial loss, and it's the same loss term that was used for the label data for the semantic branch. What concerns the discriminator network, it is optimized using the cross entropy loss with respect to two uh, sample classes. If the map comes from the semantic branch, that is assigned a class 0, and if it's a branch with map, it is assigned class 1. And by optimizing this kind of a loss, the discriminator learns to distinguish between the semantic predictions and the ground truth maps. This brings me to the uh, end of the description of the training procedure. And next, I would like to show the results that were achieved by the approach that we proposed. We evaluated, uh, we conducted the experiments for, uh, for our uh, approach using two major semantic segmentation data sets. The first is the Pascal Walk 2012. And the second one is the Cityscapes data set. For Pascal Walk, we conducted the experiments or far on five um, data fractions where the rest of the images were uh, used and unlabeled. Compared to the first work, our method performs better on all annotated data fractions, where the improvement is especially pronounced for the low label data fractions. Uh, our method performs on par with the second approach with the leading method varying from data fraction to data fraction. We have also shown that our approach is actually complementary to the second one because the authors of this approach proposed to use the classifier to refine the predictions of the semantic branch. We implemented the similar approach and the results uh, have improved. So this proves that our, our approaches are actually complementary to each other. You can also see some qualitative results um, on this figure, including the semantic predictions and the predictions made by the Latin branch. On the cityscapes data set, we conducted the experiments using four labeled data fractions. To be able to carry out fair comparison with the first work, we excluded the pre-training from our uh, experiments, and uh, we have performed this work of Mittal on all labeled data fractions, except for the fully supervised setting. Uh, comparing to the first work, we also included the pre-training into our work to be able to get uh, to be able also to compare fairly, and it shows that our work perform, outperforms the previous method on all labeled data fractions, and some quality results here as well. Finally, we also show that discovered Latin classes have actually an intuitive meaning. By plotting the conditional probability of Latin classes given the semantic classes on inference data for both data sets, we can see that the assignment is uh, very sparse. Typically, uh, for every semantic class, there's one leading Latin class. And in case of 20 Latin classes, some of the Latin classes are unused. 
qualitatively, the Latin classes learn to group the semantic classes into supercategories based on similar appearance. In the case of 10 Latin classes, some assignments may seem unexpected, but due to the low number of Latin classes, the network has to group more semantic classes. And in this case, usually, uh, it tends to group the most difficult to segment classes together. For more details uh, on our work, please refer to our paper, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you for the nice uh, talk, Olga. Um, so I would like to remind the audience to send uh, your questions from the Discord channel. Um, so it seems we have one question. Mm -hmm. uh, they first say it's very interesting work. And then um, the uh, conditional, there is a question about the conditional entropy loss. It says, mm -hmm. Um, conditional entropy loss is the same as the mutual information uh, plus a constant variable, a, a constant. Um, mm -hmm. Have you thought about connections to the information bottleneck principle? This is a very interesting question. Uh, could you repeat the second part? I didn't quite hear you. Um, so as uh, the conditional entropy loss is similar to the mutual information plus yeah. a constant, have you thought about connections to the information bottleneck principle between mm -hmm. your loss and the information uh, loss? Well, uh, I, we have not really thought about that. So May, this, this could be an interesting extension maybe. Yeah, so uh, information bottleneck principle, well, uh, one could actually say so that the Latin branch uh, network, when it produces kind of the semantic classes, it uh, reduces the information that is available from the semantic classes. So it, essentially, there is uh, some kind of an information bottleneck. However, uh, yeah, I'm not sure. I think it would be an interesting ex extension to explore, but I cannot really say a lot about it now because we haven't really looked into that direction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. So uh, I uh, I have one question. Uh, mm -hmm. Among your results um, on the uh, Pascal data set, you showed that mm -hmm. with um, um, uh, very few annotations, your results were lower than the uh, state of the art, but you were improving over the state of the art when there are more uh, annotated data. Um, have you also checked if, um, if the objects that appear in those annotations are small or with thin, um, uh, I don't know, structures or so, if your results get affected fr from these kind of corner cases more than the other methods? Um, actually, uh, our method has more improvements for uh, smaller label data fractions. Uh, so we have checked uh, on what kind of object sizes uh, it uh, improves, and it showed that it's actually the improvement is visible for objects of all kinds of sizes. So it doesn't; it's not really dependent on the size of the object. But uh, we, uh, uh, there is. Uh, ablation studies that we carried out that I didn't mention here concerning this kind of uh, improvement uh, on the smaller label data fractions. And uh, we saw that uh, some previous methods, the main uh, way that they incorporate these unlabeled images is via this uh, discriminator network. And the effect of the discriminator network, it starts decreasing if the amount of labeled data is decreasing. So for small label data fractions, it's actually uh, going uh, down and in the case of the Latin classes, uh, the effect of the Latin classes, even on the smaller smaller amount of labeled data fraction, it's still uh, more visible. Uh, so I would uh, probably yeah refer you to the paper, but uh, we did carry out the ablation studies that actually show that there is a benefit of using the Latin classes as opposed to the discriminator on uh, the small label data fraction. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, thank you. Um, so our next speaker is Jonathan Schwartz, and he is going to talk. The title of his talk is Riemannian SOS polynomial normalizing flows. Um, Jonathan, you can start. 
your session now and I would like to again uh, remind the audience to ask questions from the Discord channel. Okay. Can you all see me? Yes. Can you, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. Then I'll start. Uh, thank you for introducing me. Uh, today I want to talk about Romanian uh, normalizing flows. Romanian normalizing SOS polynomial flows. And we will start with a short introduction into the topic, and then we will derive two learning algorithms based on SOS polynomial normalizing flows and followed by some numerical experiments as well as an outlook. Assume we're given a set of samples yi, which is distributed accordingly to an unknown target distribution nu. Our goal is to model this unknown distribution. This is done using the concept of normalizing flows. Uh, we start with a simple base distribution, typically a Gaussian or something similar, and push forward this base distribution to one that seems to fit the samples yi. Assume we now found such a map t, which fulfills all these conditions, then we can easily generate more sample elements by considering a sample set distributed to accordingly to the base distribution and then plug them into the function t. However, the push forward condition is not enough to ensure the uniqueness of the map t yet. Therefore, a popular choice is to choose the map t as the gradient of a convex function, which leads to the optimal transport problem. Since the computation of such a map is generally a hard task, we will focus on an alternative. Some attempts for an efficient uh, construction of normalizing flows are shown in the overview papers by Papakarios and Kovicev. And we consider here so-called not Rosenblatt maps. These are maps which are, uh, have this uh, triangular form you can see here and which has a couple of other special properties. And since the Jacobian of a not Rosenblatt map is a triangular matrix, the evaluation of the determinant is a simple task. And furthermore, the inversion of the not Rosenblatt map is simple. And the inverse of a not Rosenblatt map is again a not Rosenblatt map. So pretty good starting point. And each map Tk needs no parametrization such that it is continuously increasing in the kth component. A recent paper suggests to use polynomials for this purpose. And in this paper by Jaini et al, a not Rosenblatt map is constructed using polynomials where the increase of the function in the last component is guaranteed by the choice of the polynomials. This ensures in combination with this integral here, a continuously increasing function in the last coordinate. And in order to ensure the positivity of the polynomial under the integral, we choose a special kind of polynomials, the so-called sum of squared or SOS polynomials. But what are SOS polynomials? Uh, a polynomial P of degree 2D is an SOS polynomial if there exists Q1 to QM polynomials of degree D, such that P is given by the sum of the squared polynomials Q1 to QM, sum of squared polynomials. A somehow natural parametrization corresponding to this definition could be to directly parameterize Q1 to QM. And this is also the parametrization that was used in the first sum of square polynomial flow paper by Yaini. And they used the conditional network to parameterize this function alpha k i l here. And we will do it a bit differently because this parametrization yields some advantages, uh, such as the unconstrainedness of the parameter space, but also some difficulties. It is not a convex parametrization, and it is therefore possible for an optimization process to get stuck in spurious local minima, which only occur due to the parametrization. In our approach, however, we generalize the SOS approach and introduce a convex parametrization to the SOS flow and equipped the SOS cone with its natural Riemannian geometry. 
This leads us to the development of two different gradient descent flows. The first one uses geodesical completeness of the cone, as well as the parametrization on the tension space, while the second one directly uses the Riemannian geometry. We can then evaluate both algorithms and could achieve reasonable results even by choosing small polynomial degrees. To find such a proper parametrization, we use a theorem from Marshall that states that if a polynomial P of X is an SOS polynomial, we can find a symmetric positive definite matrix A and rewrite this polynomial in the here stated scalar product form with a monomial basis Vx. We use this convex parametrization and identify the SOS polynomial with its corresponding symmetric positive definite matrix. And this leads to a parametrization that ensures the diffeomorphic properties of T by just staying in the positive definite cone. This leads to an alternative description of normalizing flows where one of the two conditions becomes the positive definiteness of the parametrization. And the second condition stays the push forward condition that T pushes forward our base distribution mu to our target distribution mu. We now want to specify the objective function which will ensure this push forward condition. As a distance measure, we use the KL divergence and we plug in the inverse function into the formula and obtain a well-behaving objective function. It is worth noticing here that the distribution nu only appears in the evaluation of the expectation value. So we can use the samples that are distributed accordingly to the density nu and take the sum over those values. Altogether, this leads to a well-behaving objective function that is also known as maximum likelihood loss and that we can optimize. Before we become explicit, we now want to talk a bit about some aspects of geometry of the cone. The cone of positive definite matrices can be equipped with a metric GA. And the cone of positive definite matrices together with this metric yields a Riemannian manifold. The exponential map corresponding to this metric is globally defined and given by this formula you can see here. And for the special case of the identity, the exponential map coincides with the matrix exponential. The most efficient gradient descent direction, if we have such a, grade, uh, such a Riemannian manifold, is always given by a negative Riemannian gradient. And one gradient descent step should thereby follow the geodesic induced by the metric and this negative Riemannian gradient descent step. We will now make use of this geometry framework and introduce two gradient descent flaws, which will ensure the positive definiteness of our parametrization. The Riemannian flow and the exponential flow. And we will start right now with the exponential flow. The exponential flow uses a tangent space parametrization and makes use of the geodesic completeness of the positive definite cone. And the tangent space uh, is naturally equipped with an Euclidean metric. And this makes the calculation of the gradient descent step easy. And it is given by a simple formula you can see here. The second ansatz we used is the gradient descent method with respect to the Riemannian geometry of the positive definite cone. And the Riemannian gradient descent step is uh, the Riemannian gradient descent step is therefore given by this formula here, which ensures that we stay in the positive definite cone. Now I want to show you some numerical results that we obtained by inverse sampling of 2000 sample points. And we will start again with the exponential flow. And you can see in the upper row, the tension distribution on which we sampled the training data that we denoted earlier by the YI. And then you can see the numerical results that we obtained by using SOS polynomials of different sizes. In the middle row, you can see the results when using polynomials of degree four. 
And in the bottom row, you can see numerical results when using polynomials of degree eight. For this special kind of flow, the exponential flow, it seems like there's not much improvement by increasing the polynomial degree. On contrary, the numerical results on the Riemannian flow show a very promising tendency that an increase of the polynomial size also yields an increase of the accuracy. In the bottom line, you can see that with this open ring structure, the peak in the middle is widening up and the artifacts of the Gaussian are disappearing. Furthermore, you can see in the bottom right corner for a mixture of two Gaussians, the Gaussian are almost completely separated. So basically goal achieved. And uh, yeah, this is very promising if we go to higher dimensions, uh, especially. So what have we done? In this talk, we derived a method to exploit convexity of the parameter space of SOS flows. This process removes spurious minima that could result from an unconstrained parametrization. And using this process, we could achieve reasonable results even by choosing small polynomial degrees. We use this natural geometry of the parameter space and could therefore create efficient learning algorithms. So um, the exponential flow and the Riemannian gradient flow. And in the future, we want to generalize this concept to arbitrary basis function phi. This might improve the expressiveness and performance of the algorithms. And one example for such an alternative basis choice can be found in the paper. It's about Hamid polynomials. And this was the encouragement to read the paper and not just the talk. And thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. It was very interesting. Uh, we actually have one question from the audience, which is shared by me as well. Um, so they say the improvements on the two of these examples are very impressive, but on images and audio, that still simple affine flows work as well as more advanced coupling mechanisms. Do you have an insight what might be needed to make your flows give improvements for images for more realistic scenarios? Um, well, I, I don't know exactly what you mean by flows on images. I mean, there are many different flows on images. I, I can't see right now what, what you mean exactly. So maybe a um, slight reformulation is um, um, in, in synthetic data sets, the 2D uh, examples that you showed, the results were very uh, convincing, but we haven't seen um, what would happen in data sets like com more computer vision oriented data sets. Have you done experiments on those type of data sets? Yeah, I, I, mean, I mean, we have two problems maybe. I mean, one is the scalability. I mean, we can, uh, we need more insights and maybe more progress in semi-definite programming in order to scale this method more efficiently and to make it available for real data sets. This is one thing. And the second thing is that we maybe have to, to improve our basis choice. Right now we use polynomials, which is kind of, a, yeah, it's, it's not very precise for such uh, uh, applications as images or something. I mean, for the purpose we use it. And uh, yeah, those are the main two reasons. I mean, we have to, Okay. we are depending on the semi-definite programming community in order to help us out there. <laughs> okay, this is an orthogonal improvement direction then. Yeah. Okay, thank you again. Um, so if there are more questions from the audience, um, there will be a discussion session at the end. I would invite everyone to stay and um, also discuss at the end. Now, um, the next talk is from Revi, uh, Remy Vandale, and uh, he's going to talk about automated water segmentation and river level detection on camera images using transfer learning. This is a uh, recorded talk, so we are going to come back 
um, after the talk for questions. Thank you. Hello, everybody. My name is Remy Van Dahl from the University of Reading. I'm a postdoc and I apply machine learning on image processing problems. Today, I'm going to present you my work on using transfer learning for the automated segmentation of water on river camera images. So in this work, we wanted to develop a water segmentation network. That means that we wanted to create a network that takes an RGB image as an input and produce a binary segmentation mask as an output. This mask will highlight all the water pixels of the image. You can see here an example. The image on the left is the input image and on the right, the water mask highlights all the water pixels of the image. We wanted to develop this method in the context of river monitoring and flood modeling. Typically, flood modeling is done by using data that is obtained from measuring instruments that are complicated and, con and costly to install. So instead of doing this, our idea is to use river cameras that are owned by private or public organizations and observe the river levels from the stream of images. Of course, the big drawback of this approach is that we need to automate the water segmentation if we don't want to annotate every image that we want to use manually. So currently, the water segmentation solutions we've come across were mostly giving inaccurate results on our data set. Typically, we had problems with water reflections and depending on the global illumination of the scenes, we could also end up with really bad results. For the most recent supervised methods we found in the literature, what we noticed was that while those methods were all using state-of-the-art deep learning architectures, they were also all trained from scratch on really small datasets of water segmentation images. So our impression was that even though it was a good idea to use those state-of-the-art architectures, the datasets on which they were trained did not allow those networks to perform fully well. With those conclusions in mind, our idea was to tackle the problem with transfer learning. You might know the ADA20K and CocoStuff datasets. They are the standard datasets of natural images used to evaluate the performance of new semantic segmentation networks. So our idea was to use the best performing networks trained on those datasets and apply transfer learning in order to use those methods for water segmentation. To do this, we considered three basic transfer learning approaches. The first one, pre-trained, is just about not retraining anything and aggregate the water classes used by the networks. The second one, fine-tuning, was about fine-tuning the network on the smaller water datasets that I mentioned previously. For the last one, sample selection, we fine-tuned the network over all the water images contained in the ADA20K and CocoStuff datasets. We conducted our first experiments on the two small water segmentation datasets that were previously used in the literature to evaluate the performance of water segmentation networks. On those datasets, our two approaches that fine-tune the networks, so sample selection and fine-tuning, were clearly outperforming the literature. Out of the transfer learning approaches that we tested, sample selection seems to be the one with a slight advantage. We also conducted some experiments on a homemade dataset that is not semantically annotated, but only annotated with landmark information. So basically, for each image of those datasets, we know about uh, the classes of 10 locations in each of the image. And on this dataset, we also observed that we could obtain really satisfying results. Unfortunately, here, we had no other baseline than the pre-trained networks used in our experiments. So that's it for my presentation. Thank you for your attention. If you are interested to know more, I invite you to read my paper. And if you have any question or suggestion, 
don't hesitate to contact me. Thank you, Remy, for the talk. Um, so until, until the uh, received questions from the audience, I have one question. Mm -hmm. Looking at your results, uh, it seems like when the uh, water uh, area is large on the images, it works, uh, the, the model works really well. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if, what happens if the, the water area is less visible. It occupies maybe 10% of the image or so. Have you checked? Uh, on such data set, uh, we haven't checked because uh, here we are trying actually to uh, segment river camera images and most of them are actually uh, so oriented towards rivers. So no, all that sets are not containing any uh, images where there is not a lot of water. Okay, um, thank you. So one question from the audience. Uh, so the water level is measured by having manually predefined points where you know if there is water here the water level is larger than 10 meters is there a way to automate this um, this is currently what i'm working on after this this work this is currently what i'm doing so the idea here is to use topographical data coming from lidar measurements but yes, this is not part of this work, but this is currently what I'm working on. Okay. Um, thank you for the, uh, for the questions, for the uh, answers and the presentation. Now we can move to the next uh, short oral. Baklav Volhein is going to present. Um, he, his work with the title Does SGD Implicitly Optimize for Smoothness? You can start, Vaklam. Uh, all right. Hello. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, I'll be presenting the work we did together with Christoph Lampert entitled Does SGD Implicitly Optimize for Smoothness? Uh, in this paper, we have a look at what we call the smoothness conjecture, which states that SGD implicitly selects smooth functions when training. And specifically, we investigate this conjecture for neural networks in the over-parametrized regime, meaning in the state where the network's capacity is so high that it manages to fit the training set perfectly. Uh, the reason we study this is that it has been recently observed that for such networks, uh, they have surprisingly good uh, performance on the test set as well despite the fact that they should be uh, overfit on paper. So we hope that studying this conjecture would help us towards understanding this open problem. So the first thing we have to do is design ways to quantify smoothness because it's some kind of intuitive notion which has no clear uh, mathematical formalization. And once we have these measures, uh, we can proceed by uh, performing experiments to see whether the conjecture holds uh, for specific uh, smoothness measures. Uh, so how to measure smoothness? Uh, the, perhaps the simplest idea is to identify it with steepness. So we say, uh, if a function is very steep in many places, then it is not smooth. So that would correspond uh, in linear models to the norm of the weight vector. But for uh, our case of neural networks, we take the expected value of the norm of the gradient. Uh, however, the problem with this approach is that it cannot distinguish between certain functions that uh, we don't want to consider equally smooth. Uh, for example, the pair shown here. And the way to fix this is to take into account not, or, not only first order information, so not only the first derivatives, but also the second derivatives. So then we had some uh, second order measures as well. Uh, one of these is what we call the weights product, which is specific to uh, two layer railway networks and how it works. Um, so for one dimension, uh, I'll demonstrate this. We look at where the function, the learned function changes its slope. And uh, we sum up these differences in slope and take that as the value of our smoothness measure. And here again, a higher value color corresponds to a less smooth function. 
And then we do something analogous for uh, higher dimensions as well. So uh, now that we have these smoothness measures, we performed some experiments to see for which of them the conjecture holds. And we have two classes of experiments that we performed. The first one we call monotonic monotonicity. And the idea here is that if we add more training data to the data set, we should learn less smooth functions if the smoothness conjecture holds. So for instance, uh, take these five points here, uh, fit a function through them. And now if we add another a sixth point to the data set and fit a new function, then under the smoothness conjecture, we would expect that the new function is less smooth uh, than the first one. And so this is something that we can uh, quantify uh, empirically. And we performed experiments uh, with both kinds of measures. And the results were that uh, the results were consistent with our expectations for second order measures, whereas uh, for first order measures, that was the gradient norm and so on, um, the results were much weaker. The, the trend was much weaker. And the second class of experiments is based on the idea that um, if we are already implicitly searching for smooth functions, then doing so explicitly should not help us to find smoother models. So uh, we search for counterexamples by using explicit regularization. So we add a term to the loss, which penalizes the network for having uh, high values of a certain smoothness measure. And here again, the results were consistent with the first class of experiments. And specifically for first order measures, we managed to reduce the values of the measures to about a third of the original. And again, a uh, higher measure means less smooth. Uh, whereas for second order measures, we only reduced it by about 10%, so very low. Uh, in conclusion, we managed to reject the smoothness hypothesis for first order measures whereas our results were consistent with it for second order measures. Uh, finally, I would also like to note that our experiments were applicable more broadly, uh, not just to smoothness measures, but possibly to other uh, complexity measures as well. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the very interesting presentation. You talked about very technical topics, but it was really nicely presented. <laughs> um, so then what, what is the answer to your own question? In the end, does SGD implicitly optimize for smoothness? Uh, so I can't make a, a bold statement to say that we managed to confirm the hypothesis, but the results were consistent with it. So we did reject it for first order measures, whereas for the second order ones, uh, more experimentation would be required. But from what we saw, it is not contradictory. Mm -hmm. But it would be too soon to make a stronger statement, I'm afraid. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you. Um, yeah, so we can move to the next speaker now. Thank you again for the uh, presentation. Our next speaker's, uh, speaker is Ronnie Hench. He's going to uh, talk about looking outside the box. Um, the role of context in random forest-based semantic segmentation of Poisar images. You can present, Remy. Uh, Ronnie, thank you. Yes, thanks for the introduction. Uh, so I have a maybe more application-oriented talk where we want to know how important is context to semantically segment remote sensing images, in particular Poisar images. So polar images are a little bit special. Uh, Pulsar is an active sensor, so we are not depending on the sun. Uh, we use microwave pulses to um, illuminate the earth, so we can also penetrate uh, clouds and dust to some extent. But the images are a little bit special in the sense that in every pixel we have um, either a complex valued scattering vector or a complex Hermitian matrix. And at the beginning, what we always did was to just look at the polymetic signature in a single pixel in order to derive land cover or land use classes. Then, of course, uh, a little bit later on, we used uh, larger patches to maybe include texture. And in this talk, we want to see whether increasing the local context a little bit, maybe to reason about shape, or maybe even local semantic context is, is helping the classification. In order to do so, uh, we use random forest, a specific kind of random forest, because um, 
so this kind directly learns the features from the data, so we don't have any handcrafted features anymore. And also it allows us to decouple uh, the amount of context we are using from the capacity of, of the classifier. And the way that is, is working is that we use um, local image patches centered around the pixel. In the first step, we are randomly sampling uh, a couple of regions inside of this patch where the region position and size is random. Then we select uh, a pixel inside of those regions. We could use just the center pixel, but we can also select pixels based on other properties. In the third step, we apply a distance measure that is appropriate for the corresponding data we are working on, so either the complex value scattering vectors or the Hermitian matrices. And then this distance uh, measurement is used for the random force to make the, the, the split decision. And in particular, this first step is what is necessary for investigating context, because this allows us to uh, create different variations where, for example, two regions might be very small and very close together, or the two regions that are compared are um, very large and very far from each other. As data, we use two very different data sets. Uh, one is rather old already, um, acquired by the ESOR sensor over rural area in Bavaria, and the other one is a space-borne image from Terrace X over Berlin, so a, a really dense urban area. So here you see the results when you only use the scattering vectors. Uh, on the y-axis of those graphs, you, you have security as, as kappa. And on the x-axis, there is a distance between the two regions. And the different lines correspond to different region sizes. And as you can see, when we increase the region size, we're getting better until a certain threshold where uh, well, it's actually decreasing a little bit. And also the same is true for the region distances. So performance increases first until we reach an optimum and then it decreases again. Uh, so this shows that context is helping, uh, but only to, to some extent and not as much as one might think. The so dashed lines correspond to a multi-scale approach where the random force is able to just scale everything and collect, uh, um, select the, the, the best uh, scale for, for every node decision. And as you can see, this only helps when the region distance is very small to at least have some context, but then it rather hurts. The second experiment we did with uh, not the scattering vectors, but with the polymetric covariance matrices, but the results are basically consistent. So again, uh, the larger the regions are, the better the performance is. Um, and also uh, increasing the region distance, it helps to some extent, but then it decreases again. Some qualitative results over the two test sites. Uh, so if you don't use local context, so only the scattering vectors, very small local regions, then the results are rather bad and very noisy, very um, local ambigu ambiguities. And if you increase the local context by using covariance matrices and appropriately scaled uh, projection functions, then actually uh, the accuracy increases a lot. Uh, the label noise is much decreased and local ambiguities are solved. So as conclusion, uh, the local context is really important to uh, have good classification performance. Uh, in particular, it seems to suppress local noise and, and speckle. Uh, speckle is this random fluctuation in, in the radar measurements, and it, it dissolves local ambiguities. However, long range context does not really help. And my guess would be that in the case of land cover classification, um, the local occurrence of object is uh, rather uniform. So any kind of object can more or less occur next to any other kind of objects apart from certain exceptions. And in future work, of course, we want to confirm those findings with a little bit different data. So more sensors on, on the one hand, but also multiple images. Thank you. Thank you for the very interesting talk. Uh, we have one question from the audience. They ask what areas, areas in meters do these patches correspond to? So the data we have there has more or less one meter resolution on the ground uh, in, in, in both cases, one, one, one meter, a little bit more. Um, well, and the patches go up to like 100 pixels. So it's from, from one meter only using one pixel up to 100 meters. And uh, I'm, I guess also they were asking about the labels, the kind of labels you have. So the labels um, are typical land cover classes. So forest area, urban area, road, agricultural field, and so on. And they were annotated by, by humans by, by using um, optical images as auxiliary data. Um, I have one question. So uh, in terms of com um, to be able to fit these uh, very uh, high resolution images to, uh, to the memory, you do you first uh, divide them into like regular grids and then 
use that as training data or is it possible to use the entire image all at once? So for those two images, it still fits into the memory, um, at least if, if you have a decent computer, not, not on the laptop, but with a decent computer, it still fits into the memory. Uh, for larger images and image sets, what I usually do is to use an online version of the random forest where you would load one tile of your data, then do your, your training of the random forest, then you load the next tile and then you continue. So in this case, I would just do standard tiling approaches and then use an online random forest. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. And when on the bo uh, boundaries, if there is there are two different or if the class is divided, then there are ways to handle this. Or if you do tiling, for example, um, yeah. and if you have divided the um, the land use in I a see. certain way, that there can be some artifacts introduced. Um, yeah. Well. You, you, you would have a certain overlap in your tiling in order to avoid this. But this problem is for land cover, it's not so big an, an, an issue because we, we rather have stuff classes, not so much thing classes. So it's not like you have a handheld picture of, an, of a car or a person and you would cut the, the car or person into half and then you don't see the whole object anymore. So the forest is rather like stuff classes, like mm -hmm. big forest area where you don't necessarily need to see a second area of the forest in order to make a local decision. So mm -hmm. it helps a little bit. I mean, this is what context is about, of course, but it's not so important to really make sure that you don't cut objects by, by your tiling approaches. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, thank you very much for, uh, for the, um, the uh, presentations. I would like to ask all the um, presenters to turn on their videos. We are uh, finishing this session now and um, uh, we will follow with a discussion, but the discussion is not going to be recorded. Um, I would like to invite everyone to um, uh, go back to the uh, to the Discord channel. The link can be found from the main website. And um, I would like to thank again uh, for all the uh, um, uh, the authors, for all the presenters for their contributions. It was a very interesting talk session, and I uh, hope to see you in person at some point, <laughs> maybe next year. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye.